So uh, our final speaker today is Mark Woodbridge, um, who's presenting on Squaring the Circle, the Engineering Principles Behind Minder, a healthcare platform designed for patients, carers, clinici clinicians, researchers, and developers. Thank you. That was a long version of the title. So um, I'm going to talk about a little bit what we've been doing in the uh, the UK Dementia Research Institute in building a platform for helping people and their carers, people suffering with dementia. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about what we've done, kind of how we've done it, and some lessons that we've learnt. Um, there's way too much to cover here, so if you find any particular aspect interesting, then do come and come and talk to me. Um, just to state that I'm not a machine learning expert or a data scientist, but I am going to cover a case study of how we're using machine learning and how we've productionized a particular model. So first of all, for a bit of context, something on, on dementia. So I think I've highlighted the key parts of, of the NHS's definition here. Um, yeah, it's a chronic degenerative disorder. Um, and it's called a syndrome in that it's a group of symptoms. It's not a disease in itself. Alzheimer's is the primary cause of dementia, but there are other forms of dementia, vascular, Lewy body, and others. Um, ultimately, the biggest issue in practical terms is people losing their independence. And this correlates with quality of life for the people with dementia, uh, the people that care for them, and perhaps even the people that depend on, on them. And if we can help people manage their independence, it just leads to a better quality quality of life. Um, of course, people suffering dementia can also place a burden on the NHS itself. And the projection here for 2040 is 1.6 million people with dementia in the UK, with a total cost of 90 odd billion pounds. To put that in context, that's three quarters of the current NHS budget. So clearly we're going to have to find ways of dealing with this in the future. So there are six, I think, UK DRI centres. I work in the Care Research and Technology Centre, and we're kind of distinct in that we don't try and come up with ways of diagnosing or treating dementia. We're purely about helping people stay healthy whilst living with dementia. So our particular focus is on healthy homes. So to reduce that burden on the NHF is, is, is enabling people to stay in their own homes, not in residential care or worse, in hospital. And we do that through personalising care, so providing help and assistance that's bespoke to, to the relevant individuals. So the platform that we have built is called Minder, and it starts with a network of IoT smart devices. Um, so we've got a range here, so we have door sensors, thermometers, pulse ox, blood pressure scales, on the bottom left, we have a sleep map because disordered sleep is um, important in dementia. And we have infrared sensors, smart plugs. And top left is a gateway which um, plugs all these sensors into the, into the internet. And this is how these sensors are, are configured within a home. So the data box there is the gateway. But the, it's a combination of passive, what we call passive environmental sensors, and some smart sensors or, or devices wearables um, that provide physiological readings rather than those from the environment. Um, and where it gets interesting is when, when you couple these sensors with information about the person's health, so infections, the, the medications they might be on. Uh, and the primary users of the platform are actually the monitoring team, you can see here on the bottom right, and it's not, ex it's not, it's not cheap to employ um, qualified people to in a monitoring team, but ultimately you have to compare this with the cost of residential care and care within the hospital. And I think that is a genuine free phone number that we have there. So the sensors and inputs from the carers and the people with dementia feed into the platform and there's this loop whereby the information that we gather is used to, uh, to help them live independently. And because we're not dealing with diagnosis, treatment of dementia itself, we don't have any wet labs in terms of biological research. What we do have is our living lab, which is right in the center of our office. So it's great. It's a showcase of what we do. It's a reminder 
every day of what we're doing. This is our office in the background through the glass window there. Here we have a mock-up. Well, it's not a mock-up, it's a working prototype of the living lab. The devices that we deploy in people's home and what you can't see off camera there is we have a bathroom and a kitchen. So it's very much like uh, a real home. And we have things in here we don't have in people's homes yet. We have a pressure sensitive floor so we can tell where people are, are walking, even how they're walking. Similarly, we have a radar which enables us to do gate analysis and to identify the individuals within the home without having cameras. And in the end, we gather this huge amount of, this is just from the passive sensors. Um, this is data across dates for a single individual um, across the day, across all the sensors. So looking at the user interface for this, the primary one is the dashboard. This is used by the monitoring team. And I know this is a bit fuzzy, but what you can, there's a timeline here of communications, procedures that people have undergone, um, encounters with medical professionals. That's in the center on the right hand side. There's a view of the latest physiological readings. These come through in, in real time. Uh, and also a list of issues bottom right, which is tasks that are being handled by the monitoring team in relation to these other inputs. And we can display charts from physiological data and this is fed back often or requested by medical professionals, say even the GP, and we can provide that information that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise. So that's the web app. And then there's a, a relatively new addition is a mobile app with a tablet app actually, which, um, is, is available in the home on a tablet we provide. The interesting things here are the diary, which lets people provide us with information about, about how they're feeling. Um, reminders, which might be about medication, but also top right, there's a, a two-way means of communication with people involved in the study. Um, so yeah, another great source of information for us, but also a way for us to communicate with, with those on the study. So this is a really hard thing to build and to manage competing demands from people involved with. So. You can see on the right, we've got the people with dementia, their carers, right through to people developing, using the system. And I guess what they all have in common, which is why this is in bold, is they're all looking for a usable system, right? one that's intuitive, easy to use, low friction. But there's lots of other important considerations which each apply to a subset uh, of these audiences. So our general approach to software engineering, we have a few kind of rules that we try and follow and, and I know these are earth shattering, but they're things that are continually worth reminding yourself about when we're trying to build a system for the long term. So we try and really focus on giving the team, the small team that we have, what do we know about? What are we good at? And drawing on the experience that we have on our expertise. So yeah, we use we use Java because half of the team have used it most of their of their careers. Um, we use other languages too. Um, TypeScript is actually the the majority of our code base, but um, yeah, we're very pragmatic about that. Best practice, of course, we do things like CI, CD, automated QA, code review, um, because that builds a more robust system. It's more effort and it can be expensive in terms of time and effort, but it's invaluable. Uh, we try and use boring technology. So, you know, the core of our system is kind of Linux, PostgreSQL, very simple. Auditable is not just about the patient data being auditable, but also about the system itself, which is very important because we're trying to get the system uh, CE marked at the moment. So every decision, every change we make to the system has to be thoroughly documented. It helps when doing that to make sure everything's declarative. So all our, everything's infrastructure as, as code. So when we update the system, we don't do anything manually. We update a file, which is then translated into changes to the system. And we try and use lots of simple components assembled in an intelligent way rather than using really complicated components that uh, are difficult to understand and rely on. So I'm not, you can't even read this, so I'm not going to go into the details, but basically we have these cross-cutting concerns on the bottom left, sort of logging and monitoring. We have lots of services in the middle backed by various databases. And then at the top, we have users of the system. And then we have inputs, which are our partners who provide the sensors. And on the right-hand side, we have third-party services that we depend on. So in numbers, we have quite a lot of services, but a lot of them are single purpose, many quite small, easy to develop and maintain. Quite a lot of code, I think, for a number of developers. Uh, we have approaching 5 million observations, which are readings from sensors, but also readings, um, the low volume observations about healthcare encounters and medications. Our current database is about 15 gig, which is enormous, but it's rich in data. And um, 
interesting thing is that we can get a reading coming in from a sensor available to researchers within five seconds, which involves ingesting, storing, and transforming it, uh, anonymizing it, everything else that's required um, in order to be able to make it accessible by the research team. And just to summarize, sort of top, top left are infrastructural tools that we rely on. So Postgres and Fire, which is a healthcare records database open source we rely on a lot. On the right hand side, top right is kind of infrastructure. We don't reinvent the wheel. We most heavily rely on GitLab and Azure for, for running everything. Most of our code is TypeScript with, yeah, a decent amount of Java, some Go, C Sharp. And then bottom right is the partners who provide us with the sensors and the cloud services that enable those events to, to reach us. So we're lucky in that much of the design and the user research is performed by a group called Helix, which is a collaboration between Imperial College and um, well, the Royal College of Art. Um, so they have a structure in place for speaking to users, getting feedback, co-design, which is great. And we communicate and share everything via GitLab. Um, everything is versioned, reviewed, documented. It has to be in order for us to get a medical device certification. And a lot of this requires discipline, but it also encourages discipline, right? So we put things in place to ensure that you can't push code to production without review or inadvertently even. Um, everything goes through a release process. Um, hot fixes have to be made to you know, branches that are then merged back to development. Everything else you'd, you'd expect for a system that needs to be so robust and reliable. So we make really heavy use of, of GitLab. So this is one of our build pipelines, but you can see there's a lot of stages to this around security, code review, automated deployment. Not gonna go into all of the details on that. And then we do a lot of work to like quite heavily curate issues in GitLab, tag them, add priorities, weights, statuses. And you can see that we use a kind of Kanban approach to that. So that's how we do some of the software engineering, just to touch on the data science side of things. So this, the data we get from this is really interesting because it's a mixture of unstructured and structured. Um, it's kind of conducive to supervised and supervised learning. Um, ultimately, we're looking for digital biomarkers of, of disease, of infection, changes in people's activity. Neuropsychiatry relates to people's behavior, which is a factor in a dementia or a result of dementia. So people can get uh, aggressive, impatient, um, antisocial kind of behavior, which makes life very difficult for carers as well as medical professionals. Um, and we have, like I mentioned earlier, this feedback loop whereby we get devices in from our providers. They get stored in our healthcare records database, but then they get enriched and analyzed by various online uh, and batch processing systems. So safety analysis is one example that detects anomalous values in blood pressure, for example, or body weight. And that gets done in real time and gets fed back to new alert on the dashboard, which is observed by the monitoring team. They might then call the carer and ask them to make a medical appointment. And we log the result of that appointment and see what action was taken. Then we can confirm any sort of diagnosis that we predicted. Um, and then we can fill in that loop and then improve the way we we raise those alerts in the future. So this is enabled by a really important part of the system called the research API. And this is kind of, this is one where a service that is maybe, there's a risk of overreach here because this has grown a lot since we originally built it, but we ingest data from, from the sensors in, in real time. There's a way now for other services to query that data to say, is there device, are there devices for which observations have been missing recently? Um, then the researcher's main point of contact with this is, is the batch export interface, so they can request an export for specific cohorts of patients and observation types. And we authenticate this using sort of single sign-on. We do this with Azure because both Imperial College and the DRI use um, sort of Office 365 for, for authentication. And we can authorize this based per organization as well. So it's kind of fine-grained. And then when people are done with researching or analyzing the data, they typically produce reports that need to be shared with their colleagues. So then you can send stuff back to the research API, which enables other people to see it. And we apply the same authorization restrictions there. 
I don't want to go through the UI, but again, we have a web interface for researchers to query this API. So they don't need to write code to do that. They can request and download exports using a web interface. They can also mint uh, access tokens, which enables them to use it via an API. So they can do this in an entirely automated fashion. And then besides the research API, the other interface for researchers to access data and analyze it is Kubeflow, which is an open source project that runs on top of Kubernetes. But basically, it's kind of multi-purpose. It's kind of some loosely coupled components that enables people to run Jupyter Notebooks. It's like a Jupyter Hub, but it runs on our, our hardware. So that provides user-friendly interface to, for people to use our cluster. It also enables people to upload serve uh, models to do uh, automated training. And, but mainly our, our, our use of it is to run pipelines on a, on a schedule so people can uh, retrain their models and run them against data on a, on a nightly or, or, or weekly basis, which can result in new issues being created in the dashboard. So a quick case study on UTI. The main point here is that um, ur urinary tract infections are common uh, in patients with dementia, often because um, they're either not drinking enough, using the bathroom enough, and they can be expensive, not in themselves, because UTI is relatively easy to treat, but if it's diagnosed late and people, uh, and it's therefore serious and people need to go to hospital, they often deteriorate in hospital, need to be discharged, um, but there's nowhere to discharge them to. The longer they spend in hospital, the more likely they are to end up in residential care and never return home. This is very expensive. Um, so we have a model which, um, which is just one of our models. This one can predict whether someone has a UTI, and as soon as we predict that, they can get earlier treatments. So there's an autoencoder, which is a form of dimensionality reduction. We then have a probabilistic neural net, which can then tell or suggest a score, a likelihood of currently having a UTI for each patient. And, and just to say the input here is kind of that activity map uh, of people's behavior. So uh, which appliances they may or may, or may not be using, which rooms they're occupying. And, Although we can't at the moment prevent UTIs, we can diagnose them a whole lot earlier. So we can see here that we can kind of um, suggest maybe a day or two early that they're of high risk of having a UTI. Um, it can be then validated earlier and then it can be prescribed treatment. Um, that's the model in Qflow. It looks complicated, but not all of these steps are run. They run on demand. It runs them lazily. So we don't have to re retrain the autoencoder. Uh, unless there's new a new training set um, at the bottom, which is an ensemble. So we, we aggregate several models and get a prediction. If it suggests they're at risk of UTI, they can be tested for that. You can, you can diagnose, um, give a, a prescription, and that's more likely to enable them to return home and save them a lot of uh, difficulty and the NHS a lot of money. Uh, these slides are from a a report from some health economists who've analyzed the cost effectiveness of developing and operating the Minder platform. So that's the monitoring team in particular, the cost of that and of all the software development that's happened so far. So the trouble or some challenges around doing this kind of work, um, UTIs or, or more broadly with the data science is figuring out are these predictions correct? So we do need to keep in touch with medical practitioners and, and ensure that we get test results to ensure it's working. We can't do a lot of this stuff in real time just yet, so it's kind of batch processing. Um, we don't have a great story for doing that, but we're, we're working on it. And I mean, we're part of the machine intelligence group uh, who are experienced in dealing with this type of data, but it's often incomplete. Um, it's sparse. Um, there's difficulties often with explainability when we try and explain our predictions to practitioners, so we're trying to work on that. And encouraging researchers to write models in a way that they can be productionized, so ensure that they are reliable, tested, before they get anywhere near patient data. So finally, some lessons learned. Um, we've got all these audiences. You need to know who you're trying to please at any one time. We didn't get that right. And we neither did we get the design right first time, but we're certainly getting better at it. Um, at which point does your product move from being a prototype to a product. That's a big deal in the case of certification because people want to know is this currently a research product or is it a medical device that you one day hope to market and, and roll out into a broader setting. Um, scalability is something we're struggling with right now because 
it's difficult to predict the scalability of a whole system. You might know the components work well, but when you get large scales of data, it's very difficult to predict. Um, yeah, the key message there is to build infrastructure, though. If you build the research API in Kubeflow, let other people write the models and build client libraries to make it work, and that's been very successful. Personally, I'm enjoying building something for the long term, previously been part of an RSC team, and it's great to be exposed to loads of projects and domains, but often they're very short term. This is interesting because you're working with people, and it's about the consequence of the technology, not the technology itself. How does it help people? Um, what, does it, what does it enable? And that's been inspiration for me, is being involved with a project that, that helps people like this. And to finish, these are some of the quotes that, that we've had. People don't think of it as a smart home. They think of it as people contacting them with, with interesting and helpful things to say. And they feel cared for and thought about in that way. And the key thing there is it's invisible support for carers of people with dementia. Lots of things to do in the future. But finally, I just want to thank the people who've been involved in the project. Seven Valentin has started off. It's currently me, Victor, and I. We happen to be recruiting right now, so talk to me if you're interested. But otherwise, thanks to all the people who funded it. Thank you. Five minutes for questions. Someone asks. Sure. Well, I'll deal with the first question first, which is, does this count as a medical device? And if so, how do you manage the legal implications? It does count as a medical device. But there are various classifications of medical device. Um, and the only reason it's not certified so far is because it's considered a research project. Um, and it's not something's not clear what how you're allowed to call your system a research project. But in short, it's it's providing decision support rather than if we were a system was automatically contacting carers or the people with dementia and suggesting changes in their behavior, that would certainly be a medical device. Right now, the monitoring team are prompted by the platform and the alerts raised to contact these individuals, but that could be done speculatively regardless, and they do do it routinely. So we have weekly questionnaires, for example. So we are becoming certified so that it can be rolled out more broadly, perhaps with um, less intervention by the monitoring team. And the legal implications are considerable. Well, I should say the regulations are. So it's, the, it's, a, it's an inconceivably bureaucratic process. And it's not just about the device. They're, they also audit your processes as an inf as a institution and as a development team. So even if you do something, you have to document the fact that you do it and that you've done it. Um, and it's quite a burden, um, and it's not something that would definitely suit every project or every person, but um, yeah, it has enormous benefits. So that's all I can say about that. We're not there yet. We started the process two years ago, and uh, I reckon we have a, another year to go. Take one from the room. Hi, yeah. Um, um, could you perhaps comment on what it's like to manufacture or to interface or to program the whole bio team? And yeah, the question about dealing with the variety of hardware and sensors. I mean, we're only able to manage that by working with a small number of providers. And in one of, in one of those cases, they're actually an intermediary who work as a kind of aggregator, right? So they provide us with a unified API that fronts a variety of devices. So right now we're dealing with two providers. We have a very close relationship with them. And they, they actually provide data to us in a bespoke format or one that's suitable for almost direct ingest into our healthcare record system. And that's a great help. Um, I don't think we could do it without them. I did mention devices that aren't available uh, on the open market right now, such as the radar. And it is proving difficult. So we're, in that case, we have to develop our own um, firmware to upload to a device in the person's home. Uh, and that's not really sustainable. So we're, we're working on ways to solve that problem. I'll take one more and then come back. Uh, a question from Slido. How much training is actually available? Um, well, uh, I presume there's only one living lab. Um, we have a finite number of patients. So I think we have, we're short of 50, but we're getting there. Um, 
So we have a fair amount of data around tests, but it is a, it is a, a finite data set, but this is from people's homes, not just the living lab. So um, yeah, I've not been developing the model, but we feel we have enough data to produce meaningful results. But um, we have a lot, we have, well, actually we have an enormous amount of data, but it's from a limited number of homes. So in this case, we, of course we have loads of sensor data, um, but yeah, we have a limited number of confirmed UTI cases for training data. Yep. Um, I don't have a software control, but I was curious about how do you teach patients to use this and keep engagement given that they have issues and like, how does that influence the UI? Yeah, how, do, how, does, or how do we encourage people to use and carry on using the devices? Um, yeah, this is great work by Helix. So there are devices that we could use that we don't, I guess, because people would be, be wary of them or would find difficult to use. So at the moment, we're looking at doing in-home UTI testing, but it's quite difficult to produce something which is suitable in the home setting, doesn't require a great deal of dexterity and care to make it work. So we have to be pragmatic about that. And unfortunate consequence of having dementia is 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 a lack of ability to sometimes understand or feel comfortable with certain types of technology. So our infrared sensors show a red light when they're activated, but um, one of our patients was disturbed by that and, and took all the sensors down one day. And, you know, that's difficult to know how to deal with. Of course, you can, you can reinstall should you, that probably wouldn't be wise. But if you don't do that, there's a gap in the data there. So you have to take account of that. And I was saying we do, everyone's home is different, so we can't deploy the same sensors everywhere. But yeah, there's an element of co-design consent and careful training and that case where we can readily identify uh, devices from which we haven't had data and at that point we need to redeploy them because we could confuse lack of data with um, you know person not being in the room versus is the sensor still working or um, has it been removed so yeah do you feel there are applications outside dementia there are obvious applications in terms of cognitive impairment we have a cohort who have suffered traumatic brain injury. Um, and they're actually enrolled because uh, some of those are expected to develop dementia. But in terms of living independently, um, we think this is a big enough challenge or opportunity, as it were, to, to provide benefit um, that we don't need to look beyond dementia. But um, looking at people with earlier stages, so of cognitive impairment prior to developing dementia is an area that we would obviously be interested in uh, adopting as and when. So I think that's all we have time for. Thank, Thank you. you.